yesterday's class, we looked at confidence intervals. And I hope I convinced you that they're a pretty useful way to judge the location of the population mean, without us obviously knowing where the population mean is. So just a quick recap on that, because we're going to build on that concept today. Um, so just a, a recap then of yesterday, we were saying, Z my distribution from where I measure, this is Z, that I'm illustrating here, is X bar minus mu divided by S over root Z. So it's a normal distribution with mean of mu, and it's got a standard deviation of S over root Z. N being the number of samples I take. So the more samples I gather, the tighter that, that distribution comes in. So essentially what we landed up with yesterday was say so if we take a set of data, a set of samples, N samples, I would calculate a lower bound and an upper bound for mu. So mu lies between some upper bound and some lower bound. Let me illustrate what that process does geometrically here on this plot. It says that let's say I take n samples, I'll calculate a lower bound, I'll calculate an upper bound, and that range contains the true population mean mu. Then I have someone do another set of experiments, and they gather a different set of data, and they'll capture a lower bound and an upper bound between which that mu lies. And yet another grad student does this set of experiments and they capture a lower bound and an upper bound as follows. And some of you are lucky that 19 times out of 20 you should get these ranges that capture the true mean, but there's nothing stopping you from getting a lower bound and an upper bound that does not in fact capture the true population mean. That's what the level of confidence is telling you, is how many times we can repeat this experiment and we should capture at the 95% level the mean 19 out of 20 times. But that one occasion, we're going to compute lower bounds and upper bounds that do not in fact capture the population. And notice also here, these bounds distance is different in every experiment you do. The distance from lower bound to upper bound is the total function of the data you collected and the standard deviation of the data you collected. So go back to the formula yesterday and make sure that you are clear on that. But this distance is not going to be the same for repeated sets of experiments. Okay, so that's the information you must have understood in yesterday's class. Today we're going to take that a step further and we're going to start comparing distributions from one variable to another. Okay, so today's class really, really picks up uh, where we left off. There's no recap there essentially other than what so let me, let me illustrate what today's class is by gaining this geometric form. If I go over here to this side and show, we're going to do what you've learned as hypothesis tests, comparing A versus B. Traumatic memories, hypothesis tests. A0 is equal to something full of Greek letters. T0 is greater than or less than sign. You open Montgomery and Rama, and that thing is just filled with that crap, right? So there's a copy of it. Front cover conveniently lists and lists of tables. If this, then that. If this, then that. Use this formula. Let's not deal with that. Let's look at a confidence interval approach and we get exactly the same answer. So, in a sense, it says that I take data from one system A and then I take data from system B. And if system A and B are in fact pretty identical to all intents and purposes, their population distributions, which we do not know, will coincide. Okay? So data from the green system, data from the orange system, I collect n samples from the green, I collect n samples from the orange, I calculate x bar for each one. So we'll call the orange B and the green A. And you're asking, is there a significant difference between system A and system B? Naively you'd say yes. I've calculated n samples from system B. That's the mean. I've calculated n samples from system A. That's the mean. The mean of B exceeds mean of A. System B is clearly better than A if, if you wanted something that's got a higher, higher value than better. Okay? In some instances, lower value than better. But let's say you wanted to, this was the yield of the process, and you wanted to improve the yield. System B, for these number of samples, get you a better yield than system A. Great, you go and implement system B. A few months later, you run and you learn, 
realize, well, no, really nothing's changed because the underlying two distributions are identical. System A is really the same as system B. You've just happened to take a few data points from system B that for those data points you calculated that B is better than A. Okay? Today's class we're going to look at a way to assess, well clearly if I take this range, I might get that. But if I repeat the experiment, I would calculate XB over there and XA over here. Okay, this time B is smaller than A. And I could repeat the experiment over and over. Half the times they're going to be one way and then half the times they're going to be the other way. We're going to look at quantifying that numerically today. Now sometimes it's a brain dead system. You don't really need to quantify it. I calculate, oh sorry, here's my underlying distributions. Here's system uh, B in orange with mu B. E. And here's system A. I'm going to take samples from A, I'm going to get samples all the way along this distribution. Almost always samples from B and A are going to be totally far apart. You don't need to do a hypothesis test in this case, or a significance test. One example, I take the 407 to work. You looked at that data for the assignment. The 407 almost always is faster, nine minutes faster on average. I don't need to do a hypothesis test that the 407 is a better option than taking the 403. It's clear that the answer is always going to be the 407 is faster. There will be the odd time that absolutely the 407's time gets smaller is better. The 407 time might be to an accident on the 407 and once or twice in a data set longer than the time on the 403. But for the most part, it's clear that the two are very different from each other. We don't need hypothesis tests for those cases. So here's an here's a engineering example. The yield from my batch process with system A is around here, about 68, 69%. The yield from my system with B operating under protocol B. Protocol B will be a different way of running the system. Then my yields are now around 88%. Great. No one needs to do a statistical test to prove that A and B are different. <coughs> So, reduce the light here on the board. What we're going to look at today, and guaranteed you will face the situation as an engineer, is the following. Here's an example. You're working for a company, Aspen Technologies, Honeywell, GE. They've got control systems divisions. They come to your company, and they speak to your boss, or they speak to your engineering lead, and they say, our new MPC controller, our new batch model predictive control system, our fancy control system XYZ will improve the quality of your product. We can improve the yields that you're getting from the process if you implement our control system. Your boss is, okay, great. Let's put this in. We tried for a few times. If, if you really are better and it shows up in the data, we'll go and install that control system. So, Let's take a look. System A, you've got data from system A already. This is your existing control system that's in your plant. You've been using it for a while. System B, I've up these numbers from your slides to be more realistic. When I wrote these slides, that was three, four years ago, where I didn't know what things cost in companies. Those are far more realistic. System B, easily half a million dollars, annual maintenance fees, 40 to 50,000. Typical values. A lot of money is at stake here. What do we mean by a significant difference? A significant difference is that if you implement the system for the long term, you're going to see improvement. You cannot tell Aspen technology, oh, by the way, just keep your control system installed here for a year, and then we'll come back and make a decision for you. If you get lost, we're not going to be running for free here for a year at your site. You can't run a long term test. But if you just try it out for a few goes, that's all you've got. And then they're going to come and either you keep it installed or they come and take it out. Okay? You don't have time to do a long, long trial to choose whether A is better than B. Okay? And you've got to make the right decision because the last thing you want is the reputation of that guy who is responsible for choosing the control system that never really worked. Okay? You don't want that reputation. This is going to happen to you because companies always get approached by outside vendors saying, 
Here's new polymer material that's going to work better for you. Here's a new control system that will work better for you. Here's a new way of doing things that's going to work better for you. Your boss, try it out. Try it out, try it out. Let's run a few experiments, see if it works. You make a decision afterwards. Let's take a look at the numbers. Here's the data. So, 10 previous runs of that system under your existing control unit A. 92% yield, 73% yield, 80% yield, 69, 81. Bit of variability here, obviously. Mean of 80%. You're getting an average yield from your current control system, 80%, with a standard deviation of 6.8. This new control loop, 83, 79s, 93s, 92s, 80s, you get an average yield 83%, standard deviation of 6.7. So you're getting, on average, comparing just these 10 runs versus 10 runs, the average of A <coughs> minus the average of A, 83 minus 80, you're getting a 3% improvement. Do you tell Aspen Technologies we want to keep your control system? 3% big bucks. That's worth over a whole year. You can go immediately 4N, go to your NPD calculations. 3% improvement might translate into a million dollars per annum. Is it going to be financially worthwhile? So you can go do your NPD analysis. That's a side issue here. But let's answer this question. 3%, that's worth a lot of money to us because it's real. This is not going to be trivial, do we go ahead and install that control system or not? Gut feel answers. Yes, no. No. I tell. Yes, no. Let's look at the data. Here's my box plot on the left. System A, system B. We know what box plot shows. Extremes, the whiskers, quartiles, 25th and 17th quartile. <coughs> Black line, median, okay? Here's the raw data, here's the summary of the data. Raw data, there's my mean. So notice my mean does not coincide with my median, okay? But here's the raw data. So on my current system, I'm getting yields anywhere between 90% and 70%. Using the same axes for system B, same distances here on the side of the do a fair comparison between left and right. Shift up, same square. You saw that the standard deviations are about the same. Now what do you recommend, A or B? You've got to make a decision. You can't tell your boss I'm just going to sit here. Make a decision, A or B. What do you need? Why can't Maybe you need some more information? Everyone would love more plot trials. Why can't you look at more historical data on A? Why can't you look at more historical data on A? So that's one, one question. That's something we can do. The vendors, you've signed an agreement, 10 runs. You've got to make your decision on 10 runs. These may take a month to get that. Each batch takes three days. That's a long time already for a plot trial. You're putting in an unknown system, and you're running the risk that you couldn't produce that product during these 10, uh, those 10 months. So 10 months is probably more than you would normally get from most vendors. Make a decision, A or B. Do we have dollar values for, for the, the yield increase? Let's say that, that 3% would translate to about a million dollars per year. If it's a real, real, if it's an actual 3%. If you're going to reliably get this in the long term, so short says B. What do we have here? What if those two systems really are no different to each other? They're basically just selling you a bogus thing that's doing exactly the same as what your current system is doing. Here's B, here's A. What if it's this situation? But what if it's not? What if that yield is really, those distributions are not clearly on top of each other. They're, they're obviously not this. We don't have two very distinct values. I don't have values in the 70s here and in the 90s there. I have values that are more along the lines of these distributions are closer to each other, but definitely there's a separation. What if that's the reality? And if you implement this, you will really get a million dollars extra per year. So you're, by not going with the new vendor, you're throwing money away. You're leaving money on the table. 
That's easy to do. We can do a few plus they are normal. What do you do? Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Okay. So, so Daniel's suggestion was excellent. Let's take a look at historical data. There's my plus 300 runs of A. This dotted line represents those 10 data points I showed you. So there's runs 291 to 300. That's available data to you. There's runs on the new system, B. Okay, so there's A versus B that you work with here. Now would you go with the new system? Who says, go ahead and install it? Converse. Who says, nah, they're trying to run a scan? Okay. Let's take a look at the numbers. One way you can do this with no statistical assumptions at all this is the best way to do it when you've got a big data set is as follows. You've got these great data source available to you, 300 previous runs. Go to the database and get them. Then you do the following. You're asking yourself the question, what is the possibility of a 3% improvement? So we did, we compared 10 runs of A versus 10 runs of B and you saw a 3% improvement. But let me go back to my historical data and ask, what is the chances of me seeing between any two consecutive sets of 10 runs a 3% improvement? So let's repeat that. Any two sets of consecutive 10 runs, so runs 1 to 10 versus 11 to 20, what is that percentage improvement? Write that down. Shift it over. Calculate it again. Shift it over. Calculate it again. I can calculate about 270 such average differences. And then I can see what is the chance that on average I saw a 3% improvement just by chance. Because remember, here historically I've been only using A. So we're asking relative to that base distribution, what is the chance? That's a great way to answer this question. So when you've got historical data, always go to it. Because here you've seen every single type of operation. Raw material changes, different operators, different days of the week, different temperatures outside. These 10 runs that you ran back to back could have been operators A were running the 10 runs and then the week, the next week you ran the next 10 runs and you had a different team running the process. Maybe the difference was due to them. Maybe the weather was cool on one day and the weather was warm on the other day and the system's yield is actually affected by the temperature. You just don't know that. Okay. So running things back to back, A versus B, back to back, Big no-no, never do this if you can. And you will do this because your boss is gonna tell you there's no other way you're running the system. You're gonna run 10 runs of B consecutively. You need to put your foot down and say no because by statistics, I'm gonna violate all the assumptions that I can use in my data analysis. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what I'm going to show you next is a technique that you can use that you don't rely on any of those statistical assumptions. You can go do it no matter what the situation. So go do the following. Calculate the average from batches 1 to 10. Calculate the average from batch 11 to 20. So you've got an average here and an average there. Subtract the two. Group 11, minus, uh, group 11 to 20 is average minus group 1 to 10. Notice I'm following the same protocol as what I did in my experiments. I did 10 of B that I ran after the 10 of A. So I need to subtract 11 to 20's average from 1 to 10's average. If I had run 15 experiments with the new control system B, I had to go do the same thing in my historical data. I had to go take one, runs 1 to 15 and compare them to run 16 to 30. So whatever you did in your experiment, you go and simulate that on your historical data. Go repeat the same protocol of your experiment, but using your historical data where there was really no change. And collect all those differences. So I'm going to calculate, you can work out for this that there's 271 delta differences that you can And you show them on this very nice plot called the dot plot. So George Box developed the dot. And it's a great way of showing these differences. So notice here, most of the differences, each dot corresponds to one, one set of differences. There's 271 dots, most of them stack up at zero. Most of the time there's no differences from running 
the, or computing the average from 10 consecutive sets of data. But, sorry, not 271, 281. 31 of my differences exceed that value of 3.04. 3.04, remember, was the, the percentage difference between control system B and A. So 31 out of 281 occasions in the past, I had got an average that exceeded 3% purely by chance, without any control system on my process. That's 11% of my historical data shows an improvement without any feedback control change. No assumptions of independence, no assumptions of normal distribution, no hypothesis tests, no work other than just an Excel spreadsheet. Now will you go with system A versus B? Who says A? There are a few others. Who says go with system B? Why would you go with system B, Sean? Ah, John. Um, because there's only 11% chance that it shows that it's greater. So I'm willing to take those odds. You're willing to take the odds. So he's willing to risk his reputation because there's about a 1 in 10 chance that he's wrong, but there's a 9 in 10 chance that he's right. Okay. So you don't say to your boss, pick system B. You show your boss this, and you let the group decide. Because if the group decides, you won't get into trouble. <laughs> Learn the politics. So, so that's what you do. If you're a good MBA student, you'll call a meeting. <laughs> And the group decides. Okay, but this, no, what, in all seriousness, this now gets you a basis to make the decision. You say, clearly here, there is a chance that we're going to make money on this, but there is also an 11% chance that we're wrong. If your company is extremely conservative, they'll deny going ahead. If your company is more aggressive, then maybe they're a startup company, they're a smaller player, they're willing to take these risks, they would go for the budget. So you've now taken your decision purely from the abstract numbers on a table or a plot like this, and you're now converting it over to something that's far more powerful to, to, do, a, to do a calculation. These data are in fact not independent. They were generated synthetically. They're autocorrelated with a negative correlation of 0.3. Okay, so we spoke a bit about this in one of the previous classes, that the, the data are correlated to each other. The current batch yield has got some relationship to the next batch, xk, with a factor of negative 0.3. You often see negative autocorrelation in batch systems. This is because the, the process operator will run the batch with one yield, they'll get a yield and they'll go say, okay, we, our yield was too low, let's go change the process. And they go over correct for it. Then the next batch has got too high a value. Then they say, well, it's not quite where we want it, so then they come back, they flip flop. So you get this negative correlation. So you often see this in, in poorly tuned feedback control systems that are too aggressive. You'll see this as well coming up. So these data are not independent. I'm showing this to you now because the next step that we're looking at is going to make an assumption of independence, and I'm going to tell you now that your data in practice are not independent. When you collect data from practice, they're not independent in most cases. So recognize that we're going to assume independence, but we seldom meet that criteria. I will talk a little bit after this slide on what you can do and what happens when you don't have independence. Okay, so you don't have the luxury of those past 300 data sets that Daniel had suggested us look at. You may be, for some, some companies, they don't record that information. What you're going to look at and ask is, can we still tell, using only those 10 data from A and those 10 data points from B, whether the one is better than the other? This is now your standard hypothesis test. Okay, so you don't have a reference set. So assume the data from A and the data from B are normally distributed. Easy, quick check, QQ plot on each one. We're going to assume that the variance from each data set is the same. So the standard deviation from the first data set is the same as the second set. There is a statistical test for that. You've probably seen it in your undergraduate course. 
uh, the ratio of two variances needs to be in the range around near one. We're not going to look at that. For the most part, we assume that we need that because if you run that test on most real data sets, you do need the criteria that the variances are, are the same. And then you can go pool the variances. So you've heard that term, pool the variances. That's what we're going to do again. That's why we make that assumption. Sample A and sample B they come from the normal distribution, as we've assumed up here. And we're going to call the population mean, mu A and mu B for the two samples. There, we're, this is what we're testing. Is mu A the same as mu B? That's what we're aiming for here. We've assumed now that they've got the same variance, so that means that we can just write your sigma squared. I'm not writing sigma A or sigma B anymore. Okay, so we've made that assumption up here, step two. So sample A comes from one population, let's say this green one over here, and it's got a certain standard deviation, which is the same as the standard deviation here from mu B. We're testing, is mu B different from mu A? That's where we're here. From the central limit of the earth, we can then assume that the data in A and B are independent, which we don't often have. So I'm going to talk about this later on. But let's assume for now that the data in A and the data in B are independent. That means those 10 plant trials that you did in A, those 10 data points, have no possible relationship with each other. And the 10 data points you've got from B have no possible relationship with each other. The reason why we violate an assumption in practice is because we often have the same operators, the same equipment, the same conditions in the process, the same raw materials from one batch to the next. So there clearly is a relationship between the yield that we get from one batch to the yield from the next batch. Okay, so we often violate that assumption. But let's assume that we don't. Then let me write the variance then of xA as sigma a squared over na. That we know from the central limit here. The variance of that, of that average is sigma divided by a. So we learned that a few classes ago. <coughs> If xA bar and xB bar are independent, this is another separate independence assumption. It's not the same independence assumption. This says that average of the, let's say I've calculated 10 experiments from A and 10 experiments from B, those averages are independent. Okay? That says there's no possible way that the average of the 10 runs is related to the average of the next 10 runs. That's more likely to be met in practice because the two are fairly distinctly apart in time. If we have that assumption of independence, well, we learned from your prior stats course that the variance of the sum of two variables, or the variance of the difference between two variables, is the sum of the independent variances, as long as these xA and xB are independent of each other. So I'm not going to go over that. That's a standard theoretical concept from your stats course, that you can say the sum of the variances Sorry, the, sum, the variance of the sums is the sums of the variances. So the variance of the sum or the difference, that's, that's the summation of the sign flip. The variance of the sum or the differences is the sum of the independent variances. And because I've assumed sigma A and sigma B are the same, I can bring that sigma out here. Now we're going to do something that's a little bit counterintuitive, but we're going to create a z value for that difference. Okay. So, xb minus xa is itself a variable. xb bar minus xa bar. Let me try to illustrate it as well. of those 10 samples is that circle I've drawn, xA and xB. I'm going to calculate the difference between xA and xB. So the difference is this distance. So in other words, I'm calculating here xB 
minus xa. Now I'm going to run another 10 experiments. And this time I get the triangle point. And I get a triangle point here. That distance represents the difference between the two. So this time I get a smaller distance. It's still xb minus xa. Then I run another two experiments, uh, another couple of experiments, and I'll get the square point here. And I calculate the, dif the distance. This time it's in the opposite direction. I get a sine curve. Okay. So I, re I can repeat this several times. It's clear that this distance xb bar minus xa bar is itself a random variable. I repeat the experiment, I'm going to get a different value. I repeat the experiment, I'm going to get a different value. For a situation where these two histograms are far apart, most of the time I'm going to get vectors in green that point in this part. Direction. Most of the time, I'm going to get a sample on the blue histogram that's out over here and a sample on the red histogram that's over here. I'm going to get values that are far apart. If the true underlying distributions, which I don't know, this blue and red distribution, are indeed separate, I'm going to usually get differences that are either positive or consistently negative. If I'm working on a system where the true difference underlying is not, there is no difference, there's no practical difference. I'm going to calculate xb bars and xa bars, and I'm going to get, sometimes I'm going to get positive differences between xb bar minus xa bar, sometimes I'm going to get negative values. Okay, you must be clear on this. For a system, and this is why I want, uh, this is not in the notes, I want you to draw this and, and work through it geometrically. Repeat this construction that I've just shown you there for a system where the two histograms overlap and prove to yourself that the difference xb minus xa on a system where the histograms are overlapping, you're going to get sometimes a positive value here, sometimes a negative value. Okay. On a system where the histograms are very separate here, let's take this as an example, xb minus xa, I'm going to almost always get, if I subtract xb from xa, I'm going to get values that are positive. They're almost always going to be that way around. There's only a very small probability that down here when these two tails cross, that I'm going to get a vector that goes the opposite direction. So most of my deltas that are computed on a histogram where the underlying difference is really there, I'm going to get most of them being one way or the other way. Large positives or large negatives. Very few times it's going to be the opposite. On a system where the histograms overlap, 50-50 chance of which way you're going. We're now going to calculate a statistical test that's going to assess the risk of you being wrong. Like Jonathan said, I'd rather be wrong one time in 10 and take the, the plunge and say, let's go with this new system. We're not going to try and get the same, but from statistics here. So recognizing that xb bar minus xa bar is itself a variable that can change. So we've seen we get different values for xb bar minus xa bar. Recognizing that, we can say, well, what distribution does that come from? If xa bar comes from the normal distribution, xb bar comes from the normal distribution, the difference of them also comes from the normal distribution. And we can construct a z value for those differences as well. And that's what I'm doing over here. So let's take a look at that. The z value says always follows the same rule. Take the quantity that you're computing the z for, subtract off its mean, and divide through by its standard deviation. So mu b minus mu a represents the true mean. We don't know this. This complicated messy denominator is just the standard deviation where I pool the variances. So pooling the variances is something I'm allowed to do because I've assumed that the variances from the two systems are the same. So the standard deviation, the square root of that pooled variance, the sigma squared, multiplied by one over NA plus one over NB. Now notice here, you can have different number of samples in two groups. I've chosen 10 and 10 for this 
example, but there's no reason why I could have used 15 versus 10 or some other set of combinations. So what we're going to do here is we're going to ask what's the probability of getting a z value smaller than this? Okay. I'm going to skip on to the next few slides. I will touch on them in the next class, but there are a side discussion that I really don't want to fill up the rest of this time we have available. I'd rather just get to the analysis here. And we'll come to the side discussion tomorrow's class, or the final class. Okay. Okay. So where we are right now is we're actually at step six. I'm not going to go through steps one through six again because we've, we've just looked at that. We've assumed our normal distributions, we've assumed central limit theorems, and we've got to the z value. Now that I have my z value there, we learned in the last class we can go to construct confidence intervals from the z values. We take my z value and I try to unpack it into a left, a lower bound, and an upper bound. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. Now this is a little bit messier because I'm working with differences. There's a difference here, there's a difference here, and then I've got a messy standard deviation. But you can still work through that algebra in the same process that we did last class. And we say, what is the confidence interval for that z value? Remember that z value is just one measure of xb minus xa. But I'm doing nothing different than I did yesterday's class. I'm going to find a bound a lower bound and an upper bound that will contain mu b minus mu a. Yesterday's class we were finding bounds just for a single mean up here, for a population mean. This time my population mean is not a single mean, it's actually the differences between two means. My variable of interest is the difference between two means, and my standard deviation is a combined standard deviation from the two samples. And so it's the same idea, just plug in through that process and you can get this messy equation seven, but this is the important equation. Let's take a look at that equation. Is it giving us a lower bound and an upper bound for mu b minus mu a? So what if I calculated a bound, for example, for this example we were looking at where we got a value of 3%, what if I calculated mu b minus mu a lies between seven and two. Would you go with that new control system or not? Where B represents the new system. Yes. It's saying that at 95% confident that that true difference lies between the value of 2% and 7%. So if I run that system in the future, I'm going to expect seeing differences and a consistent improvement on my process. And some days I'm going to measure a 2, some days I'm going to measure a 6, some days I'm going to measure a 1.5, some days I'm going to measure an 8. But consistently over the long term, I'm going to get a significant improvement over my, my original system. What is your recommendation to your boss if that lower bound now is minus 1 and the upper bound is 5? Likely to be over three is under three. Other other opinions? Because there is contained zero zero, so I think there is nothing changed between okay. A and B. Statistically the bound contains zero, so the usual assumption you've learned is that that it, it contains zero, there's no statistical differences between the systems. So if you were a statistician, you would say to your customer, if you're a consulting statistician, don't bother with system B, there's a chance that it's, it's no different to A. Okay. We're not statisticians, we're engineers, so we say go ahead and implement it. Because this bound only just contains zero. There's still many occasions where it doesn't contain zero. And this is the downfall of the hypothesis test. The hypothesis test just gives you a single number and says, no, don't go. There's no statistical difference. Hypothesis test gives you no idea of 
how far off or leeway that you might have. So absolutely, from a statistical point of view, don't go ahead. But we're saying, look, that down, okay, it does span zero. Some days I'm going to measure some things, the difference between the two systems, that is actually worse off than I was, or no, no difference at least. But there's going to be a whole lot of occasions when I'm going to be above zero. Zero, one, two, three, or five percent, and sometimes even more. Okay, so I like confidence intervals. I don't like hypothesis tests. Hypothesis tests just give you a single value. Yes, no, don't go ahead and do it. That's not good enough. We want to know, okay, fine, it's not good enough, but by how much, and how often, and how frequent am I going to be wrong, and how many times am I going to be right? We get far more out of a confidence interval than we do from a hypothesis test. Okay, so we must use these where available. So we've done quite a bit of assuming along the lines to get to this point. We've assumed normality, we've assumed independence. Those are things we can test for. And we've ended up with a very useful confidence interval that now we can interpret. Yes, um, between that range from negative 1 to 5, are we saying that it's a normal spread? Okay, so it's, this is, is it a normal spread? This is where um, I want to come back to now. We're going to now look at some risks okay, associated with that. Confidence interval is one way to interpret it. I can also go and look back at my z-value. Before I unpacked my z-value and got this confidence interval for you, I omitted actually calculating what z is. I'd like to do that now. So let's go take a look at that z. I can sum in my values. I know x e bar, I know x a bar. I know sigma. Sigma is 6.61. I have assumed here the long-term sigma. So in other words, I've gone and used my historical data and calculated a sigma for you. I can also go and calculate my pooled variance, and we'll do that uh, later on. But for now, I can go use my long-term sigma. So here, actually, my denominator is my population variance, square rooted. So in other words, this set is normal distributed. Later on, we can go substitute an estimate for sigma, and then this is going to be t distributed. That's what we learned yesterday. Let's just do the simpler case of thought that this is the population variance uh, for, for the long-term data set. So what I can do is, and this, is a, this sometimes throws people, is let's go ahead and assume that there is no difference between the process. No difference between B and A. If that is true, mu B equals mu A and that term disappears or sets to zero. So now I can go say z is equal to this difference, 83 minus 80, 3% divided through by that standard deviation. And I get a value of 1.03. So when you get a z value, you can immediately go reference it against what we've learned in the previous class. Here's my normal distribution z. I've normalized this data set, so the mean is zero, and the standard deviation is equal to one. So a value of z that's equal to 1.03 is a value that lies over here. One way I can interpret the z is to say, what is the probability of seeing a value of z that's 1 or less? <coughs> I know this answer is 85%. So the probability of seeing a z value that lies in the range from here all the way up to 1 is 85%. The probability of getting a z value over that limit is the difference, 15 percent. One way I like to see that, or interpret that, is to say, well, there's flip it around. The probability of seeing a value of 1 or less is, is high, it's 85 percent. The probability of seeing a value over that, that's the risk that you're wrong. That's 15 percent in this case. That says that there's a 15% chance that saying x b bar is better than x a is wrong. So 15% of the time, I could be wrong. So these are worse odds than before. So previously, we had odds of 1 in 10 or 1 in 11%. Now, by saying, OK, I'm lazy. I don't want to go look at my historical data. But I just want to go use a statistical test. Your odds are actually worse off by doing that. The odds are 15%. And you've also had to make a whole lot of unrealistic assumptions between dependence and normality, which may not exist in practice. Okay, so, so you will be worse off here in many instances. But this is still very much the same as last time. We're now saying, 
I can quantify my risk. It's now 15% chance that I'm wrong and 85% chance that I'm right. So you can go use that as your discussion. Okay, it's very much, so the question is how can I assume UV is equal to mu A and the difference is zero? It's very much the same approach to the hypothesis test. What is the hypothesis that the two means are the same? Okay, that's, so what I'm, what I'm essentially just doing is I'm calculating what's the risk that these are, uh, I'm saying, I'm assuming they're the same, what is the risk that I'm wrong? Okay, so you can go show for a process that is no different when mu A and mu B are the same. So I'm with this orange and green curve here. <coughs> Remember we said that half the time this value is going to be above zero, half the time you're going to be below zero. Okay. So if I calculate a difference in xp minus xa, and, and if, let's say those two values by coincidence xp minus xa are zero, I'm going to say zero minus zero divided by a denominator, I'm going to get a, zero, zero, uh, a z of zero. The probability of seeing a z of zero is 50%. That matches exactly what we said there earlier. Half the time I'm going to get is xd minus xa, that's above zero. So I might get a value here. Then I repeat the experiment and then get a value there. What if I get a value right out here of a very large z value on a system where there's no difference? Okay, I want you to think about that. Interpreting z in terms of risks and in terms of probabilities that you're right or wrong, takes takes some time. It's not something that just is blindingly obvious. The only way you can understand this is please go and construct histograms where the two systems overlap identically and show to yourself what would be the case if I measured an XB bar and an XA bar at different points in the row. And then go repeat that construction and show to yourself in a situation where the means really are different, and I go calculate x b's minus x a. I'm always going to get large positives here. I'm always going to get large z values here. And that means if you get a large z value, the area from minus infinity up to this large value, let's say it's a 2 or a 3, is going to be really high. It's going to be 80, 90, 95. By difference, then your risk is small. Okay? So you will. For a small risk, you're going to say, I've got a very small chance that I'm wrong. And that makes absolute sense for a system where those two histograms really are far apart. The chance of you taking a data set and getting a small z value are really, really tiny. Okay, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to calculate the value there and the value over there and get a small z and you're going to get a high risk. Very, very unlikely. For a system where those histograms are far apart, your risk is going to be low. For a system where the histograms overlap, your risk is going to be high. But that's exactly the answer that you're looking for. Okay? No one's going to implement a system that's got a 50% chance of being right and 50% chance of being wrong. Okay, so please go work through that derivation of confidence intervals. That's one interpretation. That's a great interpretation. So here's the numeric value. Just to say it again. Here's the numeric values for this system, minus 2.75 to 8.83. Okay. You can get a good interpretation of that. That translates to 15 percent. So in tomorrow's class, we're going to come back to this topic of independence, and we're going to try and relax that. Let me see where we go.